All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erin, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm with Project ECHO. Welcome to the Public Health Science ECHO, where the public has the opportunity to ask science-based questions for our public health team. For those of us uh, joining on Zoom, questions may be entered into the Q&A feature. For those joining on Facebook, please add your questions to the comment section and they'll be shared with our panelists. As a reminder, we expect all participants to keep questions and comments on topic to be considerate and to use language that is respectful. So for that, I thank you in advance. If your internet connection does not support audio, you may join us by phone by calling the phone number we've entered in the comment box along with the meeting ID. Closed captioning is available as well. The CC button is on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And thanks to our captioner. I'd also like to note that uh, the opinions expressed in this session are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent those of UAA, DHSS, or any of our ECHO sponsors. So our hub team should all be familiar faces by now. And in an effort to maximize our time together today, we'll go ahead without introductions up top and instead let our hub team members introduce themselves individually during the session when addressing questions. So without further ado, Hub Team, I will hand it over to you. And Dr. McLaughlin, if you give me a second, I will pull up those slides. Perfect. Thank you so much, Erin. And hi, everyone. Welcome uh, to another edition of the Science Echo. We really appreciate you all joining us. Uh, this is your opportunity to ask us questions. And feel free to ask whatever questions come to mind. Um, so um, don't be shy and we'll try and answer it best we're able. If we're not able to answer a question, we'll just let you know that um, and try and get an answer for you for the next, uh, next edition. So yeah, let's go ahead and start out with the slides. Great. Yep, I can see those. Great, Erin, thank you. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. And next slide. All right, so this slide is our COVID-19 cases statewide. This is our dashboard. As you can see in the upper left-hand corner, that's the map of Alaska. Almost all of Alaska is red. Not every uh, borough or census area is red. Uh, we have some in the orange and actually some in the blue there. Um, but most of the state is in the red again, and this is um, unfortunately pretty much all due to the Delta variant. Uh, total cases just over 75,000 and uh, new cases yesterday, 237. There's a lot of day-to-day -day fluctuation in cases. Um, just depends on how quickly our uh, folks can actually get the data entered. Uh, I think today we're you know, over 300 cases. Um, and so it, you are going to see some, some fluctuation, but that's generally kind of where we've been in the two to 300 cases per day now with the Delta. Uh, hospitalizations, 1,762 in total fatalities, 392 fatalities. In the bottom there, you can see the uptick in the cases. We'll show that a little better in the next uh, figure. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so here we go. Here's <clears throat> Alaska versus the U.S. You can see that uh, what's happening in the U.S. is basically kind of what's happening in Alaska. Um, we and most recently have had this very sizable uh, increase in cases. Um, and again, most of this is attributable to the Delta variant. Okay, next slide, please. Um, I think as everybody should be aware by now, we have modified our alert levels. We now have four alert levels instead of three. This is to be consistent with uh, what CDC has put out there. So, um, you know, people can look at the CDC data as well as ours and, and not have to kind of um, transpose our alert levels to theirs. So a uh, high is over one, uh, greater than or equal to 100 reported cases per one. 100,000 persons in the past seven days. Substantial is 50 to 99, moderate uh, 10 to 49, and then low, that's cut off a little bit, but it's less than 10. Um, and uh, again, we have gone to the Census Bureau uh, level, so we've got more uh, granularity in our data uh, on the map. Okay, next slide, please. 
Um, and if you click on any one of those census or borough areas, um, borough or census area, excuse me, you will get uh, information about that particular census or borough area, uh, cases over the last seven days, case rate over the last seven days. So that information is available just by clicking. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, again, here's um, our old uh, alert levels on the left and then the current alert levels on the right. Again, this is just to make the alert levels that we have consistent with CDC's alert levels. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> here's our COVID-19 testing dashboard. You can see the map on the top uh, where the percent positivity is, is graded. Um, you can see overall our percent positivity is uh, almost 7% now. Nationally, what we heard on um, CDC's national call on Monday was that uh, we're at about 10% uh, in the United States. So we're, we're still below that for the United States, but certainly higher than we want to be. As everyone knows, I, I hope that we do want to get that uh, case, uh, the, the percent positivity down below 5%, ideally down below 2%, but certainly below 5 and, and so we have a lot of room to improve on our testing. And so we really want to make sure that folks have a low threshold for getting tested. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, next slide, please. Here's our vaccine dashboard. Uh, the, the map uh, showing that Areas in the darker green have the better vaccine um, coverage rates, higher vaccine coverage rates, and those in the lighter green or the yellow have the lower or lowest uh, vaccine coverage rates in the state. You can see that our case, uh, our vaccination coverage rates continue to uh, improve, but slowly. Uh, residents 12 and up with one or more dose were at 58.6%. And then residents 12 and up who are fully vaccinated at 52.9%. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, the Delta variant is now by far and away driving the case counts. As you can see um, in the lower right hand figure, I think this shows a very nice stepwise progression in the prevalence of the Delta variant. And this is by week starting at the end of May. You can see that dark orange at the bottom has continued to grow such that now over 95% of, of all of the cases that are being sequenced come back positive for the Delta. Uh, you can see in the top there in the, in the graph that uh, Alpha, we're still getting some cases of Alpha, but uh, by far and away it's, it's predominantly Delta. Okay, next slide. This is, a, I think, a helpful infographic that CDC put up um, as of July 24th, hospitalizations and deaths from COVID-19, um, showing that on the y-axis, the vertical axis, the weekly COVID-19 incidents per 100,000 population. And then on the bottom uh, x-axis, you get three different <clears throat> graphs here. Uh, the first is disease incidents, the second is hospitalization incidents, and the third is death incidents. And the blue bars are people who are fully vaccinated, and the green bars are people who are unvaccinated. And you can see uh, what CDC has reported out as of July 24th, an eightfold reduction in disease incidents among people who are fully vaccinated and a 25-fold reduction in hospitalization as well as death among people who are vaccinated. Now, it's important to note that this is going back, and we'd have to go back and see exactly when they started um, this particular uh, counting. I don't see it in the footnote there, but <clears throat> things are changing with Delta. And as folks know, we are seeing more breakthrough cases over time. And there are a few reasons for that, and we can go into that in, um, in the Q&A. But I think in terms of the in general situ big picture, picture situation, this is a very helpful uh, graphic. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this shows pediatric cases as a proportion of all cases in Alaska. This is a question that keeps coming up on different echoes that we're doing. What proportion of the cases are in children? And in Alaska, you can see starting uh, going back March 2020 um, and then all the way through to the current month, 
that the proportion generally has increased. Um, our peak was about 25%, I think in the last uh, couple of months, it's been around 22% of, um, of cases have been among children. And you can see the blue is children age zero to 11, and then the orange is children age 12 to 17. The important distinction there, of course, is the children in the orange uh, are eligible for vaccination. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows CDC's guidance for fully vaccinated people. There are a number of updates that are primarily due to the Delta variant that CDC has put out. Uh, they say that fully back vaccinated people should wear a mask in public indoor settings in areas of substantial or high transmission. They should consider wearing a mask in areas with lower levels of transmission, particularly if they have uh, they themselves are at increased risk for more severe disease. Let's say they're immune compromised, they're elderly, or they have underlying medical conditions, or if they live with somebody who is at increased risk for severe disease. The third bullet is fully vaccinated people who have come into close contact with someone with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 should get tested three to five days after their exposure and wear a mask in public indoor settings for 14 days or until they receive a negative test result. Really want to get the word out on this because we are seeing breakthrough cases um, and a lot of these breakthrough cases in fully vaccinated people are asymptomatic cases. And so what we know is that the virus um, you know, can be transmitted from person to person, uh, even if a person is asymptomatic. So that's why we wanna make sure that, that vaccinated folks who are, uh, have this close contact exposure to a confirmed case that they mask up and get tested three to five days afterwards. And if that test is negative, they don't need to continue wearing the mask. If they decide not to get tested, please continue to wear the mask for that 14-day incubation period. Lastly, CDC also recommends universal indoor masking for all teachers, staff, students, and visitors to schools, regardless of their vaccination status. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> All right, again, getting tested is very, very important. As, as we mentioned, our, our uh, percent positivity continues to go up. That's probably because we're not doing enough testing. So we wanted to put this slide in to say, when, when is it appropriate to go ahead and get tested? Uh, first, if you're experiencing any symptoms whatsoever, uh, regardless of your vaccination status, even uh, mild cold-like symptoms, we want you to please go in and get tested. The quicker you get tested, um, the quicker that you will know whether or not you've got COVID and then you can minimize your exposure to other people and also inform people who you've been in close contact with to make sure that they are appropriately quarantined and uh, on the lookout for signs and symptoms. Uh, next, if you've had close contact with somebody with COVID-19, regardless of your vaccination status, then we do um, want those folks to get tested as well. Um, certainly, if you're in quarantine, we say it, um, you know, what we've been saying is if you day five to seven, six to seven, something like that. If you're unvaccinated, if you're fully vaccinated, day three to five. Coleman, you might uh, chime in as well for the, for the unvaccinated, folks, I can't remember if CDC is recommending testing at day three to five as well as for uh, fully vaccinated. So if you can just chime in later, that would be great. Uh, travel, pre-travel, and after you return for unvaccinated, but also can choose testing if vaccinated. So um, for folks who are unvaccinated, please uh, do get tested pre-travel uh, and, and upon return and then if you're fully vaccinated, you don't have to do that, but certainly if you would like to, again, it's another uh, layer of, um, of protection for others in particular. Uh, next, admission to a healthcare facility or before having a surgical procedure. Uh, next, screening and outbreak response in congregate settings. These are all situations where testing is warranted. And then lastly, for details, please read the section of epidemiology's guidance on COVID-19 testing in Alaska. And we actually just put out a new version of this guidance today. And so maybe Coleman can put that or somebody could put that in the chat box for folks. Okay, next slide, please. 
Um, monoclonal antibody uh, treatment, um, again, very important to prevent severe COVID illness and hospitalizations. It's an outpatient treatment. We want folks to ask your healthcare provider for more information if you do wind up developing COVID uh, infection. Um, you know, oops, sorry, previous slide. Testing ensures those who test positive can get the treatment they need. So again, if you've got signs or symptoms of COVID, please get tested. And then if you do test positive, you may be eligible for monoclonal antibody treatment, which can decrease the severity of the infection. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists issued guidance last week that recommended all eligible persons, including pregnant and breastfeeding individuals to receive the COVID-19 vaccine or vaccine series. And CDC just today uh, issued their guidance that supports these, uh, the ACOG, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists guidance. So um, now we've got not only ACOG, but also CDC strongly recommended vaccination um, for pregnant and breastfeeding women. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, back to school, DHSS resources. DHSS has information on its website for schools, school staff, parents, families, and youth, and there are a number of different resources there that uh, folks can click on when these slides go out. Um, and if you have any questions about that, please feel free to ask our panelists. Okay, next slide, please. Um, here's the COVID vaccine rates for 12 to 18 year olds uh, in Alaska by borough and census area. You can see the, the variability there. We've got a low, uh, which is quite, quite low down in Southeast Fairbanks census area of uh, one plus dose at 15% and fully vaccinated at 11%. And then our high, it looks like is about 70%. So Aleutians East borough, uh, one plus dose, 73%, and fully percent, fully vaccinated, 70%. So you can see by community that you live in what the percent coverage rate is for this, uh, for eligible children. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, COVID-19 website is uh, back up, and uh, please go ahead and visit that. I just want to make sure that everybody knew that that is back up. Okay, next slide, please. And again, the COVID-19 vaccine appointments are easy, they're free, and there's widespread availability throughout the state. You can visit covidvax.alaska.gov to get more information, or you can text your zip code into GETVAX, 438-829, uh, or VACUNA, and uh, find out where to go ahead and get tested. Okay, lots of resources there. Next slide, please. All right, that's it. Let's go ahead and open it up for Q&A. All right, let's jump right in. <clears throat> so I know that we talked about um, rates of uh, children under 12 um, getting COVID. And we have a question here asking, as Delta in cases increase, are we seeing more hospitalizations of children? Great. Yeah, thank you for that question. Let me just see if I can share screen. OK, here we go. So Aaron, can you see this slide that says pediatric cases as a proportion of all cases? OK. So we already showed this slide. So this is, we're seeing this general increase in pediatric cases over time throughout the pandemic here in Alaska. And then this is the proportion of hospitalizations by age group. And here we have 11, zero to 11 years, 12 to 17 years, and then adult cases. So you can see that uh, the proportion of hospitalizations among children really hasn't fluctuated so much. You're not seeing that steady increase in hospitalizations as you are the steady increase in the proportion of cases that are pediatric. I will say that we are hearing on some of the national calls that some states are, are seeing pretty high rates of pediatric hospital admissions, specifically in the 10 to 18 year olds um, who are unvaccinated. Um, I know I was on um, the uh, Infectious Disease Society of America Grand Round the other day, and um, it was stated, I don't have a source for it, that roughly 20% of the people admitted to the hospital currently in the United States are 10 to 18 years old. 
um, and some states such as Florida and Louisiana are seeing significant um, hospital admissions in those age groups. Yeah, thank you, Coleman. And I'll just show you, uh, can you see this graph? Coleman, yeah. Okay, so this is pediatric COVID-19 hospitalizations by month. This just shows kind of with a little bit more granularity kind of what we were seeing on this previous graph, but shows the counts of pediatric hospitalizations in Alaska um, and by age group. So hopefully that's helpful to folks as well. Um, you know, it is important to also to note that, um, you know, our, our population is small compared to most other states as well as the rest of the nation. So when really trying to get a good sense for what are the general trends with Delta in terms of pediatric hospitalizations, it's probably better to look at a larger data set like the national data set to really get a sense for that. All right, next question here. Um, asking for clarification around timelines for testing. Uh, we have a participant who's wondering why the timeline for vaccinated people getting tested is expedited and not the normal seven to, day test, seven to 10 day testing. It seems like the viral load would be lower for longer in a vaccinated individual than an unvaccinated individual. A great, great question. Um, what we're seeing with the Delta variant is that not only are we seeing higher viral loads um, among people who get infected with the Delta variant, but we're seeing that the viral loads peak earlier and the onset of symptoms uh, also starts earlier in general. And uh, with the previous strains, we saw the onset of symptom was, symptoms was on average about five to seven days uh, after infection. And now what we're seeing with Delta per CDC is that that's moved up by a couple of days. So now it's about three to five days. And so that's why CDC has recommended testing at three to five days um, if you're fully vaccinated. Um, and you know, we think that you'll, if you're infected, there's a high likelihood that you'll test positive during that time period. Um, and for unvaccinated people, I, I don't know if Coleman or somebody yeah. could speak to that. <clears throat> I have it pulled up right now. So basically um, the best time to get tested is as soon as you have any possible symptom that could be COVID vaccinated or not. Um, you know, like like uh, Dr. McLaughlin was just mentioning, when we think about the viral load, it's higher earlier on, and all of these tests have a certain amount of virus that needs to be there for them to be able to detect a positive. So, um, you know, unfortunately, false negatives, that's when people test negative, when they are in fact positive, are much more likely than uh, the other way around. You know, false positives are, are almost zero. So, with people who are vaccinated, that recommendation um, for three to five days is entirely around Delta. The reason for that is there's been some studies that show viral load and that vaccinated people have really close to the same high viral load as unvaccinated people, but for a much shorter window. So, you know, if you're exposed, there isn't a test made that's going to test positive on the first day or two after exposure. So really for vaccinated people, it's that three to five days. Now, for unvaccinated people, the recommendation for the CDC is a 14-day quarantine. Um, so 14-day quarantine from exposure, um, regardless of, of negative tests or anything like that. Um, there are options to shorten your quarantine, but the earliest they recommend testing is uh, six days. I'll put the CDC recommendations in guidance, but so for, for vaccinated, um, you know, they recommend after an exposure, recommend masking for 14 days, monitoring for symptoms do a test at three to five days, but um, no, no required quarantine for unvaccinated. Um, the, the best recommendation is a strict 14 day quarantine. And I'll that's, put that in chat. That's really helpful, uh, Coleman. Thank you for that. And there's a really good graphic that came out in a uh, preprint article last week that I think would be helpful to <clears throat> kind of demonstrate what Coleman is saying there. And this is looking at the CT values, the cycle threshold values in people who are <clears throat> infected um, by vaccination status. So if you're unvaccinated, that's the pink. And if you're fully vaccinated, you have a vaccine breakthrough case that's in the green. And what they found is this is day of illness. So let's say day one, day two, day three, day four uh, of illness. You can see that the viral loads for unvaccinated and vaccinated uh, people is about the same. 
But then what happens after about day five is you start to see this drop off, this more rapid drop off in viral load uh, among people who are vaccinated compared to uh, unvaccinated people. So unvaccinated people tend to continue to have a higher viral load for a longer period of time. All right, next question. And this is one of a couple relating to uh, the Delta variant and its increased transmissibility. Uh, this participant shares um, or asks, is the Delta variant likely to be transmissible with shorter amounts of contact than 15 minutes? Uh, and is this definition of close contact that poses transmission risk likely, likely to be revised based on this? Or is contact tracing or contact tracing strategies adjusted accordingly to include, include those exposed for less than 15 minutes. And if you need me to go over that again, I'm happy to. No, it, I don't. Yeah, thank you. It's, there. It's, it's, a, it's a good question. And actually this question was raised on Monday's CDC national call. And uh, what CDC said is they're not seeing any good reason at this point with the available evidence to modify that close contact definition. So it's still 15 minutes within six feet. And again, that's cumulative over any 24 hour period. So if you have five minutes plus three minutes plus two minutes plus five minutes around somebody who is uh, uh, infected during a 25, um, sorry, a 24 hour period um, and you're within that six feet, uh, during those episodes of close contact, then you're considered to be um, a close contact and need to quarantine if you're unvaccinated. All right, so any uh, resources for um, folks that um, might be wanting to update their mitigation practices for low density or low intensity indoor recreation, uh, such as walking or um, other circumstances? Great. Anna, would you like to take that one? None of our recommendations have really changed at this time. So we're still recommending the same sort of package of strategies for considering what to do when you go out in the public um, and sort of, you know, we recommend being vaccinated. Now there are thoughts about you should wear a mask if transmission is high, which it currently is across Alaska right now. Um, some other things you might consider are going back to some of the things we used to do about not meeting in large groups and not choosing and being selective about what activities we participate in. Um, and uh, hopefully if it stops raining, we can you know, continue to do lots of things outside because the ventilation component is a big method that helps us as well. Is there something else in there that I've forgotten to talk about? Um, maybe if there are any resources that can be linked to. I know that the COVID website oh, sure. is back up. Um, I will put some links from CDC, but they're, they're all the same ones we've been um, providing the whole time, so they should be familiar. Um, I don't think I've seen, I, I just got back into the office after being out for a couple of weeks, but as far as I can tell, it all looks pretty similar to when I left. All right, excellent. And building off of that, um, so masks, um, we've all been advised to start wearing them or to continue wearing them. Any guidance on the use of using quote unquote better masks like the KN95s or N95s? N95s. Is there any guidance on this? Thanks. So all of our recommendations on which is the right mask um, to wear remain the same. If you work in a place that has specific requirements about what kind of mask you should be wearing and whether it should be a respirator or not, follow those recommendations. If you're looking for something to use in your personal life where those recommendations don't apply, then the best, the two attributes that are the most important are one that is comfortable and you're willing to wear it and that it fits you well. A mask that fits you well um, needs to seal tightly over your nose and around your cheekbones and on the sides and under your chin and, be, um, and cover you completely. It should not have holes in it. Um, those are things to look for. We have good data that suggests that a mask that's made of more than one layer is more helpful than masks that are made of a single layer. Um, and beyond that, uh, the fit is really, really important. And the different studies um, you'll find show various combinations of like what is as effective as another thing and what's more effective. And what it really seems to come down to is that is the quality of the fit of the mask on the person who's wearing it. 
Um, so that's that's the real thing. Make sure it fits you really well and then make sure that it has um, at least two layers. If you um, want to use some kind of a respirator product like a KN95 or an N95, that's something you can choose to do, but if it doesn't fit you very well, it's not doing anything that a fabric mask wouldn't. So really make sure that it's something that fits you nicely. All right, so moving along to a question about the alert levels. Um, we have a participant asking how should they interpret each alert level? In the past, there's been an explanation of what high, intermediate, low alert means in terms of transmission beyond just the numerical definition. What are the new descriptions of each alert level? Great, I don't know if, um, let's see, who would be the best person? Elizabeth, do you wanna start with that one? Yeah, I think um, that what they're probably looking for is that um, table um, that was on the slides of you know how many cases um, refer to the high, so I don't know if we can Pull that back up, but I can put that in the chat box or someone can. I think it was missing from our web page and it's being added now. So um, I'll check our web page and see if that's been added and add that. I don't know if that answers the question. We can definitely include it as a resource um, that's linked in our uh, in the chat to our box folder. So okay. thank uh, you. That'll be there for participants to um, to access. All right, so how are Alaska's hospitals doing right now? Are non-COVID ER patients needing to wait a while for an open bed? Lisa, would you like to take that one? Yeah, so I can kind of speak in broad terms of we, as we've kind of talked about over the last few weeks, we have seen um, an increase in cases across all of our hospital systems. We also um, have had an increase in our normal summer traffic to hospitals and specifically to emergency departments as we have travelers in the state and we're all out recreating and um, needing emergency care. So uh, we have seen an increase in cases. I can speak to some of the larger hospital emergency departments are seeing an increase in wait times for non-COVID emergency patients um, and COVID emergency patients as we try to you know, see patients in a timely manner. Um, we're always trying to do the best we can to get triage patients and get them in as quickly. So um, it's something that we always struggle with in the summer, even in non-COVID years. And so it's a bit of an added uh, challenge to our hospital systems, but we're all working hard to navigate that. All right, thanks so much. Question regarding testing and cost. Is testing still free at most sites? So at most sites, um, it's no cost to the patient. They may bill your insurance. Um, they may use other federal funding streams, but at most sites, it is no cost to the patient. Um, there may be a couple exceptions to that, um, but I just recommend reaching out to your testing site to find out if there's gonna be a cost associated. All right, so uh, can our hub team explain the continued benefit of vaccination in light of the fact that vaccinated people still seem to be contracting and spreading the Delta variant? Sure, yeah, I can talk about that. So there are a number of reasons why vaccines are still um, critically important and they are our way out of this pandemic. First of all, as we've seen from that infographic that CDC uh, put forward, a, a eight-fold reduction in the incidence of COVID cases among people who are fully vaccinated and a 25-fold reduction in the risk of hospitalization and death. And these aren't percentages, it's not 25%, it's 25 times. Um, and that's based on the CDC data that they put out as of, uh, as of July 24th. If that isn't compelling enough for folks, uh, there are other reasons. People who get COVID are more likely to get long COVID. Or you, you have to get COVID to get long COVID. And so your chances of getting not only COVID, but long COVID go up tremendously if you are not fully vaccinated. Uh, other benefits, economic benefits, if you don't get COVID, you're, 
you're not going to get COVID hospitalization. And COVID hospitalization can be very expensive, tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and you're not going to get COVID ICU stays, COVID-related ventilation, or die from COVID if you don't get COVID. Uh, and the best way to protect yourself against getting COVID is to be vaccinated. Um, also, if you're fully vaccinated, you don't need to quarantine if you're a close contact to a confirmed case. We do want you to get tested at day three to five and wear a mask until um, you get tested, but you don't need to quarantine. So that uh, is a, a big burden off people's shoulders who need to be at school or at work or what have you, uh, not having to be in quarantine. Um, Lisa, anything else you would add to that? No, I mean, you said it perfectly. What we need to keep in mind is if you've been vaccinated and still get a COVID infection, your risk for serious illness, hospitalization, and death is significantly decreased. And that's the bottom line. And we just need to keep messaging that and um, letting people know those facts because that's the most important part. I think, Joe, you mentioned schools with the new CDC guidance. Um, for close contacts, if both students are masked, they're not gonna have to quarantine and get tested. So that means a lot less time um, out of school, out of sports activity. So another um, benefit to vaccines. You know, I'll add to this because I think there's some other questions to this, but really, um, I mean, vaccine is an individual choice, but it protects everyone around us. You know, if I choose to get vaccinated, I lower my risk of hospitalization, I lower my risk of death, but I also protect the people around me. So when more people make the choice to get vaccinated, we're more protected as a community. Um, I think it's important to remember, you know, every new time that somebody gets infected, that's a new chance for the virus to mutate. Um, you know, viruses aren't living, they don't have their own metabolism, they need us to reproduce. And these RNA viruses don't have good spell checkers. So every time somebody new gets infected, that's another chance for the virus to mutate. So vaccine rates also help us greatly drive down the chance of a new mutation and a new variant. Um, you know, so I think it's really important to remember that you know, it's, it's an individual choice, but it's also a community uh, risk mitigation as well. Uh, Dr. Cutchins, did you wanna share um, your uh, thoughts uh, relating to the antibody test? Yeah, so, um, you know, when we're talking about diagnostic tests, those are molecular or antigen tests. Those are swabs in the nose or in the mouth or saliva that are looking for the actual virus, either surface proteins or the genetic material. Um, for antibody tests, those are tests from the blood. Um, there's a great variability in the performance of antibody tests. Um, most of the rapid antibody tests have quite poor performance. Some of them are as low as like 50-50. You know, if you test positive, there's a 50% chance that you really have antibodies. If you test negative, there's a 50% chance that, you, you know, you don't. It's kind of the, the commercial labs that do like the antibody testing for clinical trials. There's only like three of them in the country. Um, the FDA has put out a statement saying that antibody tests should not be used to guide any clinical decisions. So at this point, um, you know, the, the antibody tests don't perform all that well. They could be used. I don't know if Dr. Domain has anything to add. You know, under the guidance of a clinician, I think it, it, it have much better utility, but just up for a personal interpretation, the FDA has said they should not be used to guide any decision. I can comment on antibody tests where they do have some benefit. Uh, we see patients that have symptoms that are suggestive of long COVID. Uh, but they, they don't have a known history of a COVID infection. So we use an antibody test to determine, did they possibly have a, an asymptomatic COVID infection that may have resulting uh, long COVID symptoms? So that's one of the areas that we find it helpful. But doing it just out of curiosity, not at all. I don't think it has a role whatsoever. Great. And Aaron, before we move on to the next question, there is um, one other benefit of getting vaccinated that I wanted to relay. <laughs> and I'm going to share my screen so folks can see this. So this is an MMWR article that CDC just put out on August 6th. It's um, risk reduction of reinfection with SARS-CoV-2 virus after COVID-19 vaccination. And what they found in this study is that people who were, who were not vaccinated 
um, well, let me let me re rephrase this. What they found is that people who had prior infection, so they looked at everybody who had already been infected with the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and had COVID. Among those people, there's a subset who got vaccinated and a subset who didn't get vaccinated. So the people who didn't get vaccinated had more than double the odds of getting reinfected than people who got vaccinated. And so this is shown here uh, with an odds ratio of uh, 2.34 and CDC's summary of this says, the study of hundreds of Kentucky residents with previous infections through June, 2021, found that those who were unvaccinated had 2.34 times the odds of reinfection compared with those who were fully vaccinated. The findings suggest that among people who have had COVID-19 previously, getting fully vaccinated provides additional protection against reinfection. And this is another one of those questions that keeps coming up. Well, if I've already had COVID, am I not protected already? And this is why we keep saying that getting, a va getting vaccinated, even if you've had prior infection, provides additional protection against COVID. You know, I'll add to that because I think there's a lot of misinformation on it. I always remind people, let alone the viruses are different, but, you know, we didn't eliminate measles. We didn't eliminate mumps. We didn't eliminate smallpox. We didn't eliminate polio until we had a vaccination. We never did those through, you know, decades to centuries of natural infection. So, you know, this isn't a new concept of, um, you know, needing really vaccination to um, provide enough immunity to, to get rid of viruses from circulating from our community. All right, thank you so much, Hub Team. So uh, how are specimens um, determined for sequencing? And are, um, and do individuals who uh, have tested positive receive information on which variant they have? I think I can take that one. Um, so uh, we are requesting that all positive specimens be um, sent to the State Virology Lab in Fairbanks for sequencing. We are not rejecting any positive specimens uh, for sequencing. Um, I, like Anna, just took a two week break. Um, and before I left, we were receiving somewhere between 200 and 300 positives per week. And that represented about 30% of the cases. And that has changed um, since I've been back. Um, we are now receiving up to a thousand specimens a week for sequencing. And we are trying our best to keep up with that capacity. Um, we may not be able to get to all of them, so we sometimes choose if it's a big outbreak or something, we might choose a few specimens from that outbreak. We don't want to continually repeat the same sequence over and over again and, and not use our resources wisely, um, but we are sequencing a lot and we are one of the most sequenced states in the country. Um, we just had a new genomics report come out today that shows that 97% of what we're sequencing is Delta variants. Um, and what was the second part of that question, Erin? Sorry. Oh, do patients get the results? Um, <laughs> no, the patients do not get the results. Um, the sequencing that we're doing is not a clinically validated test. And our accreditation in clinical laboratories state that we cannot report results that aren't validated to patients for patient care. Um, this has posed a huge problem for the sequencing um, method across the country and how we're trying to relay this information back to people and physicians. Um, so what we can do is put this report together. We can share every information data piece with our health um, partners here at the state. Uh, we, I am happy to take phone calls about specific situations and, and talk through what's going on in particular regions, but we're really um, sort of tied in, in being able to report specific patient level data on variants. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Dr. Parker. Um, Let's see here. Sorry, my screen jumped and I lost the question that I had queued up. So we'll move on to another one. A question here that says, the EBI curve for Alaska shows up shows us doubling in cases to a rate higher than we've seen in the entire pandemic in just about a week's time. What is driving this and what can be done about it? And can you also explain the factors that go into projecting an epidemiologic curve and what epidemiologists do beyond what a medical doctor would otherwise know? I know there's a lot of content there, but I think probably the most important piece would be um, 
the doubling of rape uh, and the, the question related to the timeline there. Thanks. Hey, Chur, thank you for that question. Another good question. So let's go ahead and take a look at, this is a great resource. I know I've shared this in the past. It's Our World in Data, and you can basically click on the country and see what their case rates are looking like. But um, <clears throat> let's take a look at uh, India. So India was the first country to really, where, where Delta really took off. And uh, you can see what happened in India. There was this steady increase in cases and then it peaked and then it dropped. And this peak is probably artificially low because the surveillance in India is probably not quite as good as it is in some other countries. So, but you have a general sense for the duration of the, um, the epidemic, the Delta epidemic in India. It's not over of course, but this, the duration of that spike. Now let's take a look at some other countries. Here's the United Kingdom. Uh, a much more abrupt spike and ha much higher daily uh, confirmed case rates. Um, and you can see a sharp peak followed by a sharp decline. Now what we're seeing um, in the last week or last few days actually is it's starting to go back up a little bit, unfortunately. Here's the Netherlands. Look at how sharp that increase was and how sharp the decline was. Um, France is still uh, on the upward trajectory, although they're starting to level off a little bit. And here's what the United States looks like in terms of our trajectory. So, um, you know, we're, we're definitely not alone. This is being driven by the Delta variant. Um, one of the things we know about the Delta variant is that it is much, much more transmissible than um, previous strains of the virus. Remember that the transmissibility is measured by what we call the r naught. And the R naught of influenza is about 1.3. So that means that on average, one person who gets infected is gonna infect about one other person, maybe a little bit more than that. The Wuhan strain of uh, COVID-19 virus was, had an R naught of, there we go, thank you. On um, the upper right-hand corner had an R naught of, um, oh, sorry, original Wuhan upper left, about 2.5. So one person gets infected, 2.5 others. Uh, will infect, be infected by that one person. And then what we saw with the alpha uh, variant in the middle left um, side there, alpha was about 4.5 in here, or four to five. And here's delta at five to eight. And I've actually seen uh, an updated version of this suggesting that delta might actually have an R naught closer to nine. So one person gets infected, they infect nine other people in the absence of interventions. Um, just for reference, mumps and measles, which we consider to be the most transmissible of vi communicable viruses, have r naughts of 12 and 18. So the Delta is definitely getting close to, uh, um, you know, the hall of fame for uh, high r naught viruses. Um, so hopefully that helps answer that question. I, one other question that people had was, uh, what do epidemiologists and public health practitioners do different than clinicians? So clinicians are dealing typically with one-on-one -on -one with individual patients and oftentimes involved in preventive care or diagnosis and treatment of diseases. Whereas epidemiologists, they're dealing, we're dealing with populations. What's happening, epidemiology is the study of the distribution and the determinants of health and disease states and populations. So how are disease states distributed? Are they distributed evenly or unevenly? And if unevenly, why? And are they higher in certain age groups and certain sexes or uh, races, things like that, or communities? And what are the reasons for that? We're also very involved in population level disease control and prevention. Um, there's a lot to that one. I won't go into a whole lot of detail, but very different, but we dovetail in and, and work together as a team, as a health team within communities, states, and, uh, and nations to help you know, maximize um, the health of the population and minimize the disease burden. The only other thing I would add is, Joe, that it greatly helps health equity. Um, having that data and being able to move forward, um, knowing what communities need and how we can support them in the best way.
All right. Uh, so as families return to Alaska and kids return to face-to-face -face classroom learning, what are your projections for pediatric rates in our state and rates in general? Thank you. Lisa, do you want to start with that one? Sure. I think um, anytime we're anticipating having a group of individuals be back in schools together, we have to anticipate that there could be an increase in cases. I think we're working very hard as a state um, through all the school districts, through public health, trying to find ways that we can make um, back to in-person learning as safe as we can. We understand how important this is for the kids, for their mental health, their academics, all of the above. So I think there's ways that we can mitigate that risk and we're doing the best we can to kind of get the data and science out there. Um, but yes, uh, we do anticipate some rising cases in that age group. I will say that both the CDC and the American College of Pediatrics have put out school guidance uh, very recently in the last month or two. Um, I'll put them in chat. They're very straightforward. They support one another. They're complementary. Um, and they really talk about how um, priority is getting kids back to in-person learning, um, but doing that with a multi-layered risk approach. Um, the top being getting as many as possible vaccinated um, and then recommending for things like universal masking, screening, testing, distancing. Um, I'll put those in chat. They're really good, pretty straightforward, actually pretty easy reads for him when we look at guidance. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Cutchins. Um, another question here regarding monoclonal antibody treatment. Um, how aware are Alaskan physicians um, of this option? And are they seeing positive patients in their office or referring them to the ER? So if a person with COVID-19 does not have met a medical home but wants treatment, is the ER their best option? Where do they go to get this treatment? Thanks. Well, I guess I can start with this. So monoclonal antibodies are um, the only outpatient treatment option that has shown any benefit. Um, these are drugs that are either given via IV infusion or subcutaneous injection. <clears throat> They're better if given early. Um, you know, really as soon as you get symptoms or as soon as you test positive are the times that these drugs would be most beneficial. Um, they show about a 70% reduction in the need for hospitalization or ER visit if you look at risk reduction. Um, access varies across Alaska. Um, the federal government and, and the state, we're supplying these drugs for free <clears throat> to any clinic, any provider, anyone who wants them. We've done a lot of outreach, a lot of education, um, but, but uh, access is variable. We are working on updating resources to make these uh, drugs more readily available and easier to access and easier all in one place information. Um, we are any day should have the vaccine hotline available to answer questions and help you get um, access to monoclonal. Also just here recently, monoclonals were authorized. The, the Regeneron product was authorized for post exposure prophylaxis and people who are high risk. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and put some things in chat, but that's a really good question. And just be aware, we are trying to get better information out to how people can access those uh, therapies. All right. So question um, about uh, authorization for vaccination. Um, so where are we with uh, authorization for uh, approval for vaccines for the under 12 age group? So for, uh, for under 12, the, the next group that we'll likely see an authorization for are five to 11 year olds with Pfizer. Um, we're getting closer. The trials have met enrollment, which is good news. I still think we're probably talking approximately November. Um, could be a little bit sooner, could be a little bit later. The closer we get to that date, the better of an idea we're going to have for the exact uh, time frame. For kids six months to less than five years old, um, it's looking more like early 2022. Um, those trials have not quite, quite met enrollment. Once they meet enrollment, we'll be about a four-month window out. So my best guess for you know the younger kids six months and up is we're, we're probably more like early 2022, um, and that's where we're at for, for the kids. All right, how effective are the over-the-counter at-home self-administered COVID tests for folks who have been vaccinated and uh, those who haven't? Thanks so much. 
So there's a lot of different over-the-counter tests. Um, you know, I will say, because there's some other questions about this, you know, if I test positive one day and I test negative the next day, which one's real? It's way more likely the positive is real. Um, and that's the case with all of these tests. The over-the-counter test, uh, there's such a huge variety. Some of them are a molecular test that you get on the spot. Some of them are a thing you swab and send to lab. Some of them are a rapid antigen test. I think the important thing to remember with any of the over-the-counter tests is if your test is negative and you're symptomatic, um, you should, you should uh, reach out to a medical provider. If your tests are positive, um, you should reach out to a medical provider for guidance. Um, but it, it's very difficult to kind of interpret which way that'll go as an individual. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add on that. All right, then we'll go ahead and move on to another question here. And this one actually might be um, great for you, Dr. Domain, as I know you've talked about it before. We have somebody asking if passive immunity uh, through breastfeeding by a vaccinated mother continues as long as the child is breastfed. Um, that's a good question. Uh, what we know about uh, the, the passive transmission of the IgG antibody through breast is that it provides benefit for the child up to four to six months. Beyond that, there's probably some benefit, but beyond that point, the, the infant is now developing their own uh, immune response. Uh, so it's not gonna be as robust. The majority of the IgG, uh, the, the antibody that is gonna protect them against COVID is what happens in utero. So they're born with that. The breast is more a supplemental antibody. So it's in that that's what's going to last about six months or so. So beyond that, the infant is not going to have uh, any in uh, not much passive antibody beyond six months. All right, thank you. So I know we're nearing the end here. We have about three more minutes and quite a few more questions that I know we won't entirely get through, but we have had a lot of questions about boosters. So Dr. Rabinowitz, perhaps you could give us um, the most recent guidance relating to those things. Absolutely, let's tackle boosters. This is always our hottest topic. Um, and again, lots of stuff in the media. We know that some countries have um, decided to give boosters. Currently in the US, um, the FDA has not authorized boosters and the CDC does not have a recommendation for boosters or additional doses. They are looking at the data. There was an, uh, a meeting a few weeks ago and a meeting again this Friday. The ACIP is going to, again, kind of discuss additional doses or boosters. Um, at the last meeting, they did um, decide that most likely some smaller groups such as immune compromise could benefit from booster doses. So they are still in discussion but have not made a recommendation at this point. So although it's tempting to want a booster, um, these are not authorized and not recommended at this time. We will of course update everyone right away as we get any new information about that, um, as we're anxious to hear what guidance will be given as well. Kelsey or Matt, anything to add from your perspective on that? No, just that I'll put in the chat the link for the agenda for the ACIP meeting that's taking place on Friday, and as well as um, the link for the webcast. The ACIP meetings are open for everyone to attend. This is a very transparent process. So if you have availability on Friday morning, I encourage you to attend. So I'll throw that in the chat. Aaron, you're on All right. <laughs> well, as I was saying to myself, apparently, um, this brings us to the end of our session. So, uh, Hum Team, are there any final updates before I go ahead and close us out, preferably off uh, or preferably off mute? Thanks. No, just uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. This is our way to uh, get a sense for what questions you all have. And if there are ways that we can get this information out differently, please go ahead and let us know. But uh, also spread the word if you find these echoes to be helpful. Uh, let your friends and family uh, and other coworkers, whoever, know. And uh, we'd love to see more Alaskans attending. Thank you.
All right, thank you so much to our hub team and to our participants um, for the excellent questions as always. Uh, just a reminder that this series runs weekly every Wednesday from 12 to 1 p.m. and our next session will be August 18th. Also, please remember to visit the shared box folder to access videos and resources from all echoes in this project, including today's. Uh, thank you very much and we'll see you next week. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye now.